continuing Plutarch's Lives, translated by John Dryden, revised by Arthur Hugh Cloth, and in the meantime, Pompey raised a mighty army, both by sea and land, as for his navy it was irresistible, for there were five hundred men of war besides an infinite company of light vessels, the Burnians and others, and for his land forces, the cavalry made up a body of seven thousand horse, the very flower of Rome and Italy, men of family, wealth, and high spirit, but the infantry was a mixture of inexperienced soldiers, drawn from different quarters, and these he exercised and trained near Bero, uh, where he quartered his army himself, no ways slothful, but performing all his exercises as if he had been in the flower of his youth. Conduct which raised the spirits of the soldiers extremely, for it was no small encouragement for them to see Pompey the Great, sixty years of age, wanting too, at one time handling his arms among the foot, and then again mounted among the horse, drawing out his sword with ease in full career, and sheathing it up as easily, and in darting the javelin, showing not only skill and dexterity in hitting the mark, but also strength and activity in throwing it so far that few of the young men went beyond him. Several kings and princes of nations came thither to him, and there was a concourse of Roman citizens who had held the magistries. So numerous that they made up a complete senate. Labienus forsook his old friend Caesar, whom he had served throughout all his wars in Gaul, and came over to Pompey, and Bratus, son to that Bratus that was put to death in Gaul, a man of high spirit, and one that to that day had never so much as saluted or spoke to Pompey, looking at him as the murderer of his father, came then and submitted himself to him as the defender of their liberty. Cicero, likewise, though he had written and advised otherwise, yet was ashamed not to be accounted in the number of those that would hazard their lives and fortunes for the safeguard of their country. There came to him also in Macedonia, Tedius Sextius, a man extremely old and lame of one leg, so that others indeed mocked and laughed at the spectacle. But Pompey, as soon as he saw him, rose and ran to meet him, esteeming it no small testimony in his favor when men of such age and infirmities should rather choose to be with him in danger than in safety at home. Afterwards, in a meeting of their senate, they passed a decree on the motion of Cato that no Roman citizen should be put to death but in battle, and that they should not sack or plunder any city that was subject to the Roman Empire, a resolution which gained Pompey's party still greater reputation, insomuch that those who were nowadays at all concerned in the war, either because they dwight afar off, are thought incapable of giving help, were yet in their good wishes upon his side, and in all their words so far as that went, supported the good or just cause, as they called it, esteeming those as enemies to the ones that they considered to be gods and goddesses, and to the men that wished not the victory to Pompey. Now, the word could be daman, and I'm, I'm okay with the damans. Um, not the same thing as daiman, but sort of. Um, neither was Pompey's clemency such, but that Khazar likewise showed himself as merciful a conqueror, for when he had taken and overthrown all Pompey's forces in Spain, he gave them easy terms, leaving the commanders at their liberty, and taking the common soldiers into his own pay, then repassing the Alps and making a running march through Italy, and came to Brundusium about the winter solstice, and crossing the sea there, landed at the port of Orticum, and having Jebius, an intimate friend of Pompey's, with him as his prisoner, he dispatched him to Pompey with an invitation that they, meeting together in a conference, should disband their armies within three days, and renewing their former friendship with solemn oaths, should return together into Italy. Pompey looked upon this again as some new stratagem, 
and therefore marching down in all haste to the sea coast, possessed himself of all forts and places of strength suitable to camp in, and to secure his land forces as likewise of all ports and harbors commodious to receive any that came by sea, so that what wind whatsoever blew, it must needs in some way or other be favorable to him, bringing in either provision, men, or money, while Khazar, on the contrary, was so hemmed in both by sea and land that he was forced to desire battle, daily provoking the enemy and assailing them in their very forts, and in these light skirmishes, for the most part, had the better. Once only he was dangerously overthrown, and was within a little of losing his whole army, Pompey having fought nobly, routing the whole force, and killing two thousand on the spot, but either he was not able, or was afraid, to go on and force his way into the camp with them, so that Khazar made the remark that today the victory had been the enemies. Had there been any one among them to gang it, Pompey's soldiers were so encouraged by this victory that they were eager now to have all put to the decision of a battle. But Pompey himself, though he wrote to distant kings, generals, and states in confederacy with him as a conqueror, yet was afraid to hazard the success of a battle, choosing rather by delays and distress of provisions to tire out a body of men who had never been conquered by force of arms and had long been used to fight and conquer together, while their time of life now advanced one which made them quickly weary of those other hardships of war, such as were long marches and frequent decampings, made making trenches and building fortifications, made them eager to come to close combat and venture a battle with all speed. Pompey had, all along, hitherto, by his persuasions, pretty well quieted his, his soldiers. But after this last engagement, when Khazar, for want of provisions, was forced to raise his camp and pass through Athamania into Thessala, it was impossible to curb or allay the heat of their spirits any longer, for all crying out with a general voice that Khazar was fled. Some were for the pursuing and pressing upon him, others for the returning into Italy. Some there were that sent their friends and servants beforehand to Rome to hire houses near the Forum, that they might be in readiness to sue for offices. Several of their own motion sailed off at once to Lesbos to carry to Cornelia, whom Pompey had conveyed thither to be in safety the joyful news that the war was ended and the senate being called and the matter being under debate. Afranius was of opinion that Italy should first be regained, for that it was the grand prize and crown of all the war, and they who were masters of that would quickly have at their devotion all the provinces of Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, Spain, and Gaul. But what was of greatest weight and moment to Pompey, it was his own native country, that lay near. Now, of course, uh, I forget uh, I, I, the Y is a U sound and the C is a K sound. So, Sicula. Um, reaching out her hand for his help, and certainly it could not be consistent with his honor to leave her thus exposed to all indignities and in bondage under slaves and the flatterers of a tyrant, but Pompey himself, on the contrary, thought it neither honorable to fly a second time before Khazar that be pursued when a fortune had given him the advantage of a pursuit, nor indeed lawful for the entities to forsake Scipio and diverse other men of consular dignity dispersed throughout Greece and Thessala, who must... Oh, yeah, Greeks with a K, right? Um, who must necessarily fall into Khazar's hands, together with large sums of money and numerous forces, as to his care for the city of Rome that would most eminently appear by removing the scene of war to a greater distance and leaving her without feeling the distress of even hearing the sound of these evils to await in peace the return of whichever should be the victor. 
With this determination, Pompey marched forward in pursuit of Khazar, firmly resolved with himself not to give him battle, but rather to besiege and distress him by keeping close at his heels and cutting him short. There were other reasons that made him continue this resolution, but especially because a saying that was current among the Romans serving in the cavalry came to his ear, to the effect they ought to beat Khazar as soon as possible, and then humble Pompey too. And some report that it was for this reason that Pompey never employed Cato in any matter of consequence during the whole war, but now, when he pursued, Khazar left him to guard his baggage by sea. Fearing lest, if Khazar should be taken off, he himself also by Cato's means, not long after, should be forced to give up his power. Whilst he was thus slowly attending the motions of the enemy, he was exposed on all sides to outcries and imputations of using his generalship to defeat, not Khazar, but his country and the Senate, that he might always continue in authority, and never to cease to keep those for his guards and servants who themselves claimed to govern the world. Domitius Anobarbus, continually calling him Agamemnon, the king of kings, excited jealousy against him, and Favanius, by his unseasonable raillery, did him no less injury than those who openly attacked him, as when he cried out, Good friends, you must not expect to gather any figs in Tusculum this year, but Lucius Afranius, who had lain under an imputation of treachery for the loss of the army in Spain, when he saw Pompey purposely declining an engagement, declared openly that he could not but admire why those who were so ready to accuse him did not go themselves and fight this buyer and seller of their provinces. With these and many such speeches, they wrought upon Pompey, who never could bear reproach or resist expectations of his friends, and thus they forced him to break his measures, so that he forsook his own prudent resolution to follow their vain hopes and desires, weakness that would have been blamable in the pilot of a ship, how much more in the sovereign commander of such an army and so many nations, but he, though he had often commended these, those physicians who did not comply with the capricious appetites of their patients, yet himself could not but yield to the malady and disease of his companions and advisers in the war, rather than use some severity in their cure, truly who could have said that health was not disordered and a cure not required in the case of men who went up and down the camp, suing already for the consulship and office of Prater, while Spinther, Demetius, and Scipio made friends, raised factions, and quarreled among themselves who should succeed Khazar to the dignity of his high priesthood, esteeming all as lightly as if they were to engage only with Tigranes, king of Armenia, or some petty Nebathaan king, not with that Khazar and his army, that has stormed a thousand towns and subdued more than three hundred several nations, that had fought innumerable battles with the Germans and Gauls, you know, they had city-states and stuff back then, um, and always carried the victory that had taken a million of men prisoners and slain as many upon the spot in pitched battles. But they went on soliciting and clamoring, and on reaching the plain of Pharsalia, they forced Pompey by their pressure and importunities to call a council of war, where Labienus, general of the horse, stood first and swore that he would not return to the battle if he did not rout the enemies, and all the rest took the same oath. That night Pompey dreamed that as he went into the theater, the people received him 
with a great applause, and that many, and that he himself adorned the temple of Venus, the victorious, with many spoils, a vision partly encouraged, but partly also disheartened him, fearing less that splendor and ornament to Venus should be made with spoils furnished by himself to Kasser, who derived his family from that female entity. Besides, there were some possible, uh, some panic fears and alarms that ran through the camp with such a noise that it awakened him out of his sleep. And about the time of renewing the watch towards morning, and there appeared a great light over Kazar's camp whilst they were all at rest, and from thence a ball of flaming fire was carried into Pompey's camp, which Kazar himself says he saw as he was walking his rounds. Now Kazar, having designed to raise his camp with the morning and move to Skatassa, whilst the soldiers were busy in pulling down their tents and sending their cattle and servants before them with their baggage, there came in scouts who brought word that they saw arms carried to and fro in the enemy's camp and heard a noise and running up and down as of men prepared for battle. Not long after there came in other scouts with further intelligence that the first ranks were already set in battle array. Thereupon Kazar, when he had told them that the wished for day was come at last, when they should fight with men, not with hunger and famine, instantly gave orders for the red colors to be set up before his tent, that being the ordinary signal of battle among the Romans, as soon as the soldiers saw that, they left their tents, and with great shouts of joy ran to their arms, the officers likewise, on their part, drawing up their companies in order of battle, every man fell out fell into his proper rank without any trouble or noise, as quietly and orderly as if they had been in a dance. Pompey himself led the right wing of his army against Antony, and placed his father-in-law Scipio in the middle against Lucius Calvinus. The left wing was commanded by Lucius Domitius, and supported by the great mass of the horse. For almost the whole cavalry was posted there in the hope of crushing Caesar and cutting off the 10th legion, which was spoken of as the status in all the army, and in which Caesar himself usually fought in person. Caesar, observing the left wing of the enemy to be lined and fortified with such a mighty guard of horse, and alarmed at the gallantry of their appearance, sent for a detachment of six cohorts out of the reserves, and placed them in the rear of the 10th legion, commanding them not to stir, lest they should be discovered by the enemy, but when the enemy's horse should begin to charge and press upon them, that they should make up with all speed to the front through their foremost ranks, and not throw their javelins at a distance, as is usual with brave soldiers, that they come to a close fight with their swords the sooner, but they should strike them upwards into the eyes and faces of the enemy, telling them that these those fine young dancers would never endure the steel shining in their eyes, but would fly to save their handsome faces. This was Kazar's employment at that time. But while he was thus instructing his soldiers, Pompey on horseback was viewing the order of both armies, and when he saw how well the enemy kept to their ranks, expecting quietly the signal of battle, and, on the contrary, how impatient and unsteady his own were, waving up and down in disorder for want of experience, he was very much afraid, and the ranks would be broken upon the first onset, and therefore he gave out orders that the van should make a stand, and keeping close, and the rank should receive the enemy's charge. Kazar much condemns the command, which he says not only took off from the strength of the blows, which would otherwise have been made with a spring, but also lost the men, the impetus, which, more than anything, in the moment of their coming upon the enemy, fills soldiers with impulse and inspiration. The very shouts and rapid pace adding to their fury, which upon pay deprived his men, arresting them in their course and cooling down their heat. Kaiser's army consisted of 22,000 and Pompey's of somewhat above twice as many. When the signal of battle was given on both sides and the trumpets began to sound a charge, most men, of course, were fully occupied with their own matters. Only some few of the noblest Romans, together with certain Greeks, there present, 
standing as spectators without the battle, seeing the armies now ready to join, could not but consider it in themselves to what a pass, private, ambition, and emulation had brought the empire. Common arms and kindred ranks drawn up under the self-same standards, the whole flower and strength of the same single city here meeting in collision with itself, offered plain proof how blind and how mad a thing human nature is when once possessed with any passion, for if they had been desirous only to rule and enjoy in peace what they had conquered in war, the greatest and best part of the world was subject to them both by sea and land, but if there was yet a thirst in their ambition that must still be fed with new trophies and triumphs, the Parthian and German wars would yield matter enough to satisfy the most covetous of honor. Scythia, moreover, was yet unconquered, and the Indians, too, where their ambition might be colored over with specious pretext of civilizing barbarous nations, and what Scythian horse, Parthian arrows, or Indian riches could be able to resist 70,000 Roman soldiers while appointed in arms under the command of two such generals as Pompey and Caesar, whose names they'd heard of before, that of the Romans, and whose prowess by their conquest of such wild, remote, savage, and brutish nations were spread further than the fame of the Romans themselves. Today they met in conflict and could no longer be induced to spare the, their country, even out of regard for their own glory or the fear of losing the name which till this day both had held, and having never been defeated. As for their former private ties and the charms of Julia and the marriage that had made them near connections, these could now only be looked upon as tricks of the state. Well, nothing wrong in its essence with marrying and or, or having friendships or whatnot for status reasons. The mere securities of a treaty made to serve the needs of an occasion, not the pledges of any real friendship. Now, therefore, as soon as the plains of Pharsalia were covered with um, Uh, I'm not sure what that is. Something that ends in E-N? Oh. Okay, the... If this was straight, then I'd say... Uh, the, with men, horse, and armor, that... And that the signal of battle was raised on either side. Caius Crassianus, a centurion who commanded a company of 120 men, was the first that advanced out of Khazar's army to give the charge and acquit himself of a solemn engagement that had that he had made out to Khazar. He had been the first man that Khazar had seen going out of the camp in the morning, and Khazar, after saluting him, had asked him what he thought of the coming battle, to which he, stretching out his right hand, replied aloud, Thine is the victory, O Khazar. Thou shalt conquer gloriously, and I myself this day will be the subject of thy praise either alive or dead, in pursuance of this promise he hastened forward, and being followed by many more, charged in the midst of the enemy, that there came at once to a close fight with their swords and made a great slaughter. But as he was still pressing forward and breaking the ranks of the vanguard, one of Pompey's soldiers ran him in at the mouth, so that the point of the sword came out behind at his neck, and Crassianus, being thus slain, the fight became doubtful and continued equal on that first part of the battle. Pompey had not yet brought on the right wing, but stayed and looked about, waiting to see what execution his cavalry would do on the left. They had not, they had already drawn out their squadrons in form, designing to turn Khazar's flank and force those few horse, which he had placed in the front, to give back upon the battalion afoot, but Kasser, on the other side, having given the signal, his horse retreated back a little and gave way to those six subsidiary cohorts, which had been posted in the rear as a reserve to cover the flank, and which now came out, 3,000 men in number, and met the enemy. And when they came up, standing by the horses, struck their javelins upwards, according to their instructions, and hit the horsemen full in their faces. They, unskillful in any manner of fight, 
and least of all expecting or understanding such a kind as this, had not courage enough to endure the blows upon their faces, but turning their backs and covering their eyes with their hands, shamefully took to flight. Kaiser's men, Kaiser's men, however, did not follow them, but marched upon the foot and attacked the wing which the flight of the cavalry had left unprotected and liable to be turned and taken in the rear, so that this wing, now being attacked in the flank by these and charged in the front by the 10th Legion, was not able to abide the charge or make any longer resistance, especially when they saw themselves surrounded and circumvented in the very way in which they had designed to invest the enemy. Thus, the East being likewise routed and put to flight when Pompey, by the dust flying in the air, conjectured to the fate of his horse, it were very hard to say what his thoughts or intentions were, but looking like one distracted and beside himself, and without any recollection or reflection that he was Pompey the Great, he retired slowly towards his camp, without speaking a word to any man exactly according to the description in the verses. But Jove from heaven struck Ajax with the fear, Ajax the bold, then stood astonished there, flung over his back the mighty sevenfold shield, and trembling gazed and spied about the field. Now, I don't know what this looks like in Greek or Latin or whatever, so um, there can be a lot of changing in some of the meanings to make a poem out of something that was a poem, um, more than other things, right? In this state and condition, he went into his own tent and sat down, speechless still, until some of the enemy fell in together with his men that were flying into the camp. And then he let fall only this one word. What? Into the very camp? Well, who knows? That could be one word, or it could be one phrase. In Arabic, there's the... They say kalama, like it's a singular word, and they're like... It's, it's single phrases, or something, um, or a single statement, and said no more, but rose up, and putting on a dress suitable to his present fortune, made his way secretly out. By this time, the rest of the army was put to flight, and there was a great slaughter in the camp among the servants and those that guarded the tents. But of the soldiers themselves, there were not above six thousand slain, as is stated by Asinius Palio, who himself fought in this battle on Khazar's side when Khazar's soldiers had taken the camp. They saw clearly the folly and vanity of the enemy. For all their tents and pavilions were richly set out with garlands of myrtle, embroidered carpets and hangings, and tables laid and covered with goblets. There were in large bowls of wine ready, and everything prepared and put in array in the matter ready of people who had offered sacrifice and were going to celebrate a holiday, then of soldiers who had armed themselves to go to battle so possessed with the expectation of success, and so full of empty confidence that they had gone out that morning. When Pompey had gone a little while from the camp, he dismounted and forsook his horse, having but a small retinue with him, and finding that no man pursued him, walked on softly afoot, taken up altogether with, his, with thoughts, such as probably might possess a man that for the space of thirty-four years together had been accustomed to conquest and victory, and was then at last in his old age learning for the first time what defeat and flight were, and it was no small affliction to consider that he had lost in one hour all that glory and power which he had been getting in so many wars and bloody battles, and that he who but a little before was guarded with such an army of foot, so many squadrons of horse, and such a mighty fleet, was now flying in so mean a condition, and with such a slender retinue, that his very enemies who fought him could not know him. Thus, when he had passed by the city of Larissa, and came into the pass of Tempe, being very thirsty, he kneeled down and drank out of the river, then rising up again, passed through Tempe, until he came to the seaside. There he betook himself to a poor fisherman's cottage, where he rested the remainder of the night. The Next morning, about break of day, he went into one of the river boats, and taking none but those that followed him, 
except such as were free, dismissed his servants, advising them to go boldly to Khazar and not be afraid. As he was rowing up and down the shore, he chanced to spy a large merchant ship, laying off just ready to set sail, the master of which was a Roman citizen named Petichias, who, though he was not familiarly acquainted with Pompey, yet knew him well by sight. Now it happened that this Petichias dreamed the night before that he saw Pompey, not like the man he had often seen him, but in a humble and dejected condition, and in that posture, discoursing with him. He was then telling his dream to the people on board, as men do, when at leisure, especially dreams of that consequence, when of a sudden one of the mariners told him that he saw a river boat with oars putting off from the shore, and that some of the men there shook the garments and held out their hands with signs to take them in. Thereupon, Petichius, looking attentively at once, recognized Pompey just as he appeared in his dream, and, smiting his hand on his head, ordered the, mer the mariners to let down the ship's boat, he himself waving his hand and calling to him by his name, already assured of his change and the change of his fortune by that of his garb, that, uh, so that, without waiting for any further entreaty or discourse, he took him into his ship together with as many of his company as he thought fit and hoisted sail. Uh, hoisted sail. And there were with him two Lentuli and Favonius. And a little after, they spied King Diotarus making up towards them from the shore, so that they stayed and took him in along with them. At supper time, the master of the ship, having made ready such provisions as he had aboard Pompey for want of his servants, began to undo his shoes himself, which Favonius, noticing, ran to him and undid them, and helped him to anoint himself, and always after continued to wait upon and attended him in all things as servants do their masters, even to the washing of his feet and preparing his supper, insomuch that any one there present, observing the free and unaffected courtesy of these services might have well exclaimed, O heavens in those that noble are, whatever they do is fit and fair. And, well, people deserve dignity even when they've lost their rank, but um, you don't have to wash their feet. <laughs>